Welcome everyone. This is the um, Global Investigative Journalism Conference webinar on human trafficking and forced labor. And we have a fairly amazing panel set up for us today. And my name is Martha Mendoza. I'm an Associated Press journalist and um, welcome. Feel free to put any questions you have in the Zoom chat. Um, you also can, we'll also be keeping an eye on our GIJN pathable chat. If you want to put them there, they'll move over. And just to start, I want to talk about what our definitions are of human trafficking and forced labor. Um, when an individual is being forced to do something that they don't want to do, that kind of is our umbrella for human trafficking and forced labor. So if somebody has paid a large recruitment fee for a job and they are working the job to pay off that fee and they don't want to be doing that work. That's called debt bondage. And that is under the definition. Um, any child working anywhere, anytime is child labor and it's illegal under United Nations and US um, and most countries definitions. And there are all kinds of exceptions to that, but basically children working means children working illegally. Uh, sex trafficking is a very large umbrella and we could spend an entire session talking about prostitution and sex trafficking, but when women or men are forced to have um, sexual relations and it's not what they wanna be doing and it's not their choice, that's sex trafficking. And then there comes the very tricky one of human smuggling versus paying somebody to help you move. Um, and I'm so glad we have Charles here to help us with those as well. But um, human smuggling often becomes a forced, um, a forced situation of human traffic. We're gonna be diving into all of this. And um, with us today, we have Roli Srivastava, who is a Thomson Reuters Foundation correspondent. We have Robin McDowell, my colleague and Associated Press investigative journalist and an extraordinary reporter. Annie Kelly, The Guardian's Rights and Freedom series editor, who will be walking us through not only some of the reporting, but also how to manage these types of products. And Charles Elfman, who we're very fortunate to have because he has created a how-to for journalists for the International Labor Organization, and he'll be sharing that with us. Um, I see we have close to 60 people with us, and so I don't want to take any more of our time. I would like to um, ask Robin McDowell to begin just by talking about a very um, extremely challenging and also very inspirational project and very impactful project she did for the Associated Press um, related to forced labor and palm oil. So welcome everybody. And Robin, if you can unmute yourself, I'll mute myself and, and um, you can share screen and we'll begin. Sounds good, thank you. First, I just wanted to, to say that, um, you know, when it was actually a project that I did with Margie Mason um, and we, pretty much have done all of our big projects together. So forgive me, but when I'm talking, I might, <laughs> I might often say uh, we when I'm talking about our projects because it, these are really all team efforts. Um, I wanna back into this a little bit. I think every investigative reporter has their own way of working. Um, some people are FOIA fanatics. Some people rely heavily on tips from sources or have incredible databases, but I think um, when you're talking about uh, labor abuses and trafficking, um, debt bondage, those issues, it is really something that is very difficult to do if you don't have the boots on the ground um, and access to the workers. And it's incredibly, incredibly beneficial, I found as well, when the story you're working on is effectively in your own backyard. Um, because you become aware at that point, not just, you know, you know the issue, you know how big the issue is, but you also know what do people who are interested in this topic, labor rights activists, human rights workers, um, lawmakers, businessmen, what do they know? What do they not know? Um, and that is how you are really gonna kind of uncover the open secrets. If you find 
big issues dealing with trafficking, slavery, and that, that people have not really connected the dots of what is happening, why is it happening, where are these products going? Um, that's, kind of, that's kind of the gold star, I think. Um, and unraveling the mystery of these open secrets, you've really won at that point. Um, so that was true with the 2015 Seafood from Slaves series, of course, Martha, you're very familiar with, um, and Esther Husan. And, um, and, you know, that was the same type of reporting went into what we did with the palm oil, um, though we learned a lot of lessons from that, from that um, investigation. And I think um, the murkiness of supply chains today makes it really easy for companies to claim ignorance. So doing a dot to dot um, really is the one way that you can force them to address it, force governments to address it. Um, when we started looking into the palm oil industry, um, one of the main reasons we were interested in it was because it is such a massive industry. It's a $65 billion industry. Um, products go to you know, almost every cosmetic beauty company, snack foods, um, you can find it in paints, pesticides, pills. It is almost impossible to avoid palm oil in your lives. And most people don't really realize that. And they also don't realize for the most part that it comes from basically two countries, Indonesia and neighboring Malaysia. Um, and that it requires tens of millions of workers. It's a heavily intensive labor industry. Um, the fruit after it's cut from the trees needs to get to the mill within 24 hours. And as, as um, the demand has grown globally, I mean, it's basically, if you look at a line chart from the 1980s um, to the middle of this century and, and beyond, it's at a 45 degree angle. There's no sign that it's slowing. And um, there is a, always going to be a demand for workers. And that's especially true in Malaysia. So um, what we found in this investigation was really, I think that the thing that most surprised us was how pervasive the problems were, but how different they were across different communities. So the migrant workers that had been trafficked from um, or tricked or you know, ended up going to Malaysia from some of the poorest corners of Asia, um, were their passports were seized by their employers. Um, they would not be able to, you know, like they worked long hours, they weren't getting overtime, they were having wages deducted for things like electricity, water, and they were essentially trapped and um, constantly threatened by raids from immigration or police thrown into detention. Um, so that was that was largely their story, and it was true. It was a true across, you know, from company to company, plantation to plantation, to varying degrees, um, depending on basically the plantation owner or the the manager on the plantation. Um, and then with women, um, this was something that Margie was especially interested in, and had been had been very little studied. Um, their problems dealt with, you know, rape in the fields, sexual, sexual pressure from bosses, um, being rewarded with good jobs if they, if they, you know, basically did what the boss forced them to do. Um, also dealing with the pesticides on a day to day basis, you know, problems there with skin ailments, um, carrying heavy loads, lifting, standing and squatting and standing and squatting again and again dealing with things like the fallen womb, womb syndrome. Um, so it, it really was, um, you know, their problems were unique as well. And, it, and they often were not paid or paid much less than the men because they were helping, you know, meet quotas as were children. So because the, because the company set impossibly high quotas, the men and sometimes when they're working with their wives cannot meet those quotas and they bring in the whole family. So the kids were working, um, you know, some of them had never seen the inside of a school, they had stopped dreaming. Um, and, you know, us young girls faced their own, their own threats to young girls, especially with trafficking and sending them across borders. And, and um, so that, that was an issue as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges was telling the stories without putting 
putting these workers in greater danger. Like men on the boats, they are working on plantations that are basically in a sea of trees. Um, the, they're living sometimes in metal containers um, or very rudimentary housing. The, the managers and company owners have in the past targeted workers who have spoken to the media or come out or, or spoken to rights groups or their name, you know, come out publicly to complain. And they can identify them sometimes just by the clothes they're wearing because they, you know, they have so few clothes, clothing, sometimes by a license plate in a photograph um, or the numbers that they put on the trees or just recognizing the buildings. Uh, so they, they would, so we were very, um, we were very conscious as, as you always have to be on in these types of situations about, are we gonna make things worse for these people? And um, the way that we, our strategy in dealing with that was to have everybody speak on, you know, well, not everybody, the, the, those who were still on plantations and had not escaped or returned home to their home countries. We didn't use their names. We didn't use photos of their faces. Um, and as everybody knows, this is really, this is not an ideal situation to be in as a journalist. I mean, it really, it really takes away from the story to have to do this. Um, but we addressed that issue by uh, just sheer volume and talking to as many workers as we could. So I think in the end, and this was mostly Margie, she was on the ground there, um, was she spoke to a hundred and well, together we spoke to 130 workers um, covering for, from two, from two dozen different companies in both countries. Um, so, um, what's that doing there? So, um, that was kind of how we tried to get around the anonymity issue. Um, and um, I think another thing I wanted to point out about the story is this was a supply chain story. We did track it to you know major companies, cosm the the women the women workers who had been abused in the fields, we tracked their, we tracked their products to, um, you know, cosmetic companies, L'Oreal, um, Colgate Palm Oil, Palm, Palm, Oil, Palm Olive, um, Unilever, ma maker of Dove soap, pretty much everyone. Um, we also track, traced it to food companies like Nestle, Hershey's, PepsiCo. We even traced um, child labor to Girl Scout cookies here in the United States. Um, and we also wanted to put a spotlight on the major financial institutions that were fueling, that have been fueling the rapid growth. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to do in general um, because they are perhaps more vulnerable to being found, um, to being found guilty of violating kind of money laundering, um, money laundering and other, other things that, that really, um, they respond, I think they respond perhaps more seriously than the companies who tend to give lip service and say, oh, we, we respect human rights. Um, and they don't really, so far, have not really been held accountable. Robin, Emily has your slideshow up and she's just gonna pop through these amazing photos that accompanied your projects. And if you wouldn't mind just saying a word about each of them, uh, kind of really literally like what we're looking at. So yep. for the people who are visual reporters on this session. Um, these were a bunch of men who were trying to get to Malaysia. Um, they were Bangladeshi. They were going through a smuggling route that um, but they were intercepted in Indonesia. Um, this is a female worker who's doing the pesticide spraying. They basically, the women do all the pesticide spraying. Um, and uh, that's what that is. <laughs> And these are women again carrying the carrying the loads, um, and the these fruits are incredibly heavy. They're sometimes eighty pounds per fruit, and they this the standing up and squatting, standing up and squatting, carrying these all day is really impacting their bodies and especially their uh, their wombs. And they sometimes had to carry tie, tire tires around their waist to keep them from protruding out of their bodies. And this is a woman who was raped by one of the male supervisors um, and, and became pregnant. And these are some of the products that, um, that you find. We love this slide actually, and it's not, I don't even think it's explained in the caption, but these are the hands from 
nine generations of families work of women working on a plantation in Malaysia, holding um, products that palm oil can be found in from their plantation. And this is a girl um, who had not gone to school and she's, it's just, a, just heartbreaking how many children are expected from the time they're born um, to just keep working and get trapped in kind of a generational cycle. And this is the same girl. This is, this is Olivia, she's a um, Girl Scout and in Tennessee, she had taken on the cause of um, palm oil when I think when she was 10, she started and her main focus was environmental issues, um, destruction of rainforests, killing of orangutans, um, climate change. And she hadn't, she hadn't heard um, until she saw our stories about the labor and child labor. So she kind of pulled that into her, into her campaign. She's really, <laughs> she's a fireball. She organized, um, she organized, she tried to get Girl Scout troops and did, she got a couple to start having bake sales and sell those instead of the Girl Scout cookies for their, <laughs> to earn money for their troops. So now we're gonna shift to Rolly, who's gonna talk about um, what's, about labor abuse, but also specifically what's been happening in India during COVID in terms of labor abuse and um, both the challenges and some of the advantages of reporting during lockdown and what local journalists can do to cover these issues themselves as well. So hi, my name is Roli. I'm a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation and uh, I have been writing on trafficking and forced labor issues for the last few years. My, I'll be talking about the pandemic and the stories are around forced labor that we covered. Just to give a background, which all of us are familiar with by now, that uh, it was early March, it was mid-March, when the ILO said that about 25 million jobs will be lost across the world. It was still early days in India and we didn't quite know what uh, this loss of 25 million jobs would mean. And that's when the Indian government announced a complete lockdown. About a week after the ILO's prediction, a complete lockdown was announced. It was described by officials as the world's biggest lockdown because it was 1.3 billion people whose movement had been restricted. All transport services were suspended, and that included trains and buses. And this led to uh, about 10 million workers who worked in factories, in garment uh, workshops, in brick kilns, it led to a massive reverse migration. And this exodus became the biggest story of the first lockdown in India last year. Uh, my colleague in Chennai, Anuradha, and I, uh, we were nudged early on by our editors in London that we continue to cover our uh, focus areas, that's marginalized communities. We have been writing about people in underprivileged situations, people in forced labor, people, human trafficking survivors and victims, all of that. But how are we connecting the pandemic to each of these verticals? And that nudging had come in by late January itself. So we were already in touch with several uh, rights groups and several labor unions, but none of us had predicted the exodus and the related stories that would emerge from it. We didn't imagine what would happen next. So when the exodus began, like just to explain, when the exodus began, it was from all major cities of the country, like Bombay, Delhi, Chennai. And these are hubs for uh, industries. These are garment hubs in the South. And there were people who were leaving by in tens of thousands of uh, numbers. What was different here was unlike ground reporting, when we go to a certain region, uh, to a geographical patch, we spend time over there, meet people, meet survivors, meet village council heads, as in get an entire look and feel of the place that we are covering. And of course, in a nut graph, explain how this applies to the rest of the country and where does the rest of the country fit in the rest of the world, all that. Here, there was a crisis unfolding across the country on its national highways. So while we were covering those stories, uh, we, the biggest challenge was getting through to these people. There were travel restrictions, we were working remotely. So the biggest challenge was like, how do you speak to them? Like the people who are on national highways, like we were, like I said, working remotely most of the time. How do you quantify them? There was no concrete data on the total number of people who had hit the roads. Do we have a number for migrant numbers in the country? We found out that we didn't, even officials didn't. 
And that led us to, you know, digging up all kinds of sources. So wherever there was a problem, of course, we started looking for solutions, but initially we were hit by this lack of data, lack of phone numbers, the ethical dilemmas. We finally got through numbers. We finally started speaking to people, but here, were, here they were fleeing. They, were, they had been abandoned by industries and cities that they had worked in. And the last thing they wanted to do was speak to a journalist and give an interview. So how do you navigate that ethical dilemma? How do you, uh, and are you a journalist or an activist? Like many of us who've covered a humanitarian crisis would have experienced, I'm sure Robin did too, uh, that the people you're interviewing at the end of it seek to find out what is in there for them. Why should they be speaking to you when they are themselves in such a difficult circumstance? All you need is a quote out of them, a story out of them or whatever. Would they understand that the reason why you're doing this story, why the story has to go out to readers in the country, outside the country, would it strike a person who's not eaten anything for 24 hours? Would the larger goal of a journalist make any sense to a person like that? So what do you do at that time? Like, are you a human being, an activist, a journalist? Like those were the dilemmas that we had to constantly tackle. And this was a fast moving story. The exodus began yesterday and today they were like the number of people on the roads was swelling. The third day there were accidents, people being run over by trucks who were sleeping on the roadside. Then there were people who were on the railway tracks who decided to sleep on a railway track, assuming that the trains were not running in any case, and they were run over by a, by a, uh, by, by, by a train. So there was a crisis unfolding day after day after day, so keeping pace with that. So while we reported, like, how did we, how did we navigate those challenges? I'm not saying that we all will be covering a, God forbid that a humanitarian crisis such as this should not unfold anywhere. But like in case there is a similar situation where we are unaware of which sources to tap, if there are no, if there is no data, where do you go? And here are some learnings, like what helped us. So there were, uh, helplines, which became really handy tools for us because uh, nonprofits and local governments had set up helplines for migrant numbers as, in, uh, as the numbers kept increasing. We called up the people who were manning the helplines and the officials in charge of the helplines to figure out what were the number, how many people were calling and why they were calling. And that gave us some idea on the quantifying of the numbers, like, okay, are we looking at hundreds? Are we looking at thousands? And what is the nature of the problem that they are talking about? Is it food? Is it shelter? Is it transport? Is it money? What exactly did they call the helpline for? So that qualitative and quantitative information came from there. Academics became the best resources as, you know, they were great sounding boards. And uh, we, during an investigation, we rely on of course, as many worker interviews, like in our supply chain investigations that we've done, say on the garment industry or in the diamond industry in India or the sand mining industry, in each of these investigations, we have relied heavily on as many interviews, like Robin mentioned in her palm oil investigations, you get as many worker voices to corroborate the, the problem that you are kind, you're reporting on. This is the problem. And these many workers have kind of spoken to me about it. So Robin, in Robin's case, there were about 100 odd people that they reached out to. In our case, we were working remotely during the pandemic. So while, uh, and this was a different model that we had to quickly adopt, adapt to because not that we had a choice, but we were working, like we were just thinking on the go that, okay, who can be tapped for this information? So academics became big sources because they, they, because they could contextualize the anecdotal. We, we're approaching them that this is the anecdotal information we have, but the academics who are like on labor rights, who are, you know, who teach labor rights at universities, they could contextualize this and they were heavyweights. So their quotes in the story added a lot of heft to the stories. Then of course, tracking social media because a lot of people on the roads were imagine leaving their numbers on Twitter for help. And uh, we felt guilty uh, approaching them using those numbers but we didn't have a choice. And like I said, that ethical dilemma continues to play in our heads. Uh, I'll also tell how we navigated those ethical dilemma later, but th this is what helped. Uh, local officials, of course, helped a, a lot because uh, this was not a time to uh, 
simply blame local officials that you didn't know this was coming because they were also foot soldiers in a larger exercise right now. But we were just asking them, so what are the numbers you're working on? What is the information you have about these workers, et cetera? And collaborations, like I can't emphasize enough something like uh, Robin said that she used the word we, which is something that all journalists, all investigative journalists, and in this case, in my case, uh, my colleague and I worked closely and that kind of helped us because we collaborated. It helped us cover more Indian states. India, as worst a country as it is, we could cover more Indian states. We, we divided the number of labor officials she was speaking to, the number of labor officials I was speaking to, the kind of workers she was reaching out to, the set of workers that I was reaching out to, academics on one side, international experts for a, you know the big picture quotes and whatever on the other side. So this collaboration helped a big deal for us to cover not just a geographical region, but also in terms of the scope of these stories, as in it just widened the scope of the stories. This resulted, I'll not, this is just a few headlines of the stories that we did that where we tried to take these stories forward. Like here was the exodus. Now you've gone past quantifying. You've gone past the problems they are facing. But what does this exodus mean in the context of forced labor? So in the first one, uh, the, the first example I'm showing here, that what happened to these workers after they reached the villages? Was it happy ending? But it wasn't because they had, they had lost their jobs. They had taken up new loans to make this journey happen from the cities to their villages. How were they repaying these loans? They pledged their sons and daughters to work on farmlands of the money lenders. So, uh, so there was a forced labor situation arising out of an exodus, of a migrant exodus. What happened to the people who did not flee, who were taken care of by the employers? Uh, they were given food and they were given shelter through the lockdown period. What happened to them? Well, their wages were deducted when work resumed because the employer said, well, we can't be, we couldn't have fed you for free. There was the other story, like what, what did the pandemic, this is of course flagged by the UN as well, that the pandemic resulted in a regression of the, all the progress made in child marriages because any extra mouths to feed for a person who had lost his job or her job was a burden. So the, and the schools were shut, all the children were at home, the smartphone accessibility was is poor in rural parts of the country. And that led to a spike in child marriages. And then there was the other, the, who was doing the strenuous work of counting all these thousands of migrant workers who were returning, of quarantining them, of checking, of carrying out RT-PCR tests to ensure that they were COVID free. It was about a million rural women healthcare workers in India who were paid as less as $50 a month for this job. So there were these forced labor stories that we could, uh, these are some of the examples. While I'll just point out how voices are important in these stories, despite the, uh, the logistical challenge of not being able to meet a lot of people in person, we managed with a lot of persistence and patience to get some great interviews uh, and it's credit to the people who spoke to us and not our credit at all because uh, they took out the time. So here was uh, the story that I mentioned about uh, post labor, post migration, because people pledged their children to money lenders to work on their farms, et cetera, in a classic case of dead bondage, which is the most prevalent form of modern slavery in India. Here's what one guy, the, one of the people I spoke to said, and it still remains fresh in my mind, that how relation between a laborer and a lender is timeless. It stretches for many lives. He said that when I asked him, by when do you think your son will be free from the money lender's farm work? And he said, it can just stretch for generations. This is a quote from a labor union person who said that, uh, who spoke about the garment workers who were taken care of during the lockdown. And he said that they thought that they were being taken care of, but then they didn't realize even once that they would have to kind of lose wages to repay their employer. And the third quote is of a child bride, and I managed to speak to her uh, where she said she was gutted that the marriage was called off because there was intervention by officials and she was completely uh, disheartened because she said there was no food to eat. The marriage she thought was her ticket to freedom as well as 
it would give respite to her family that had no food for days on end. So uh, these were the several shades of uh, the reports. Uh, the sourcing, uh, like Robin also mentioned, uh, in this case, because we could not speak to several workers, in the case of the rural healthcare uh, women workers, what the only way for me to establish how they were being underpaid was to speak to as many unions across the country as possible. So I got payment records of 600 of them. And that effectively showed that they were paid just about $54 a month. And this is after the government had announced a hike in their wages for all the COVID duties that they were doing. Uh, this was another uh, sourcing, which we all do in any case which is unions, we reach out to unions. In this case, this was the Karnataka Government Workers Union, and they dug, in, dug into the information they had about the additional labor for free that people were expected to do to repay all the uh, money that employers had spent on them during the lockdown. So in this case, uh, about 208 hours, out of which a worker was expected to work 100 and, 104, 104 hours without overtime. So that is the extent of forced labor uh, in a post-pandemic situation. We used data, this is just an example, all of us do it, but just to show that we used the data that we collected finally. Now I have it on my fingertips from not knowing what the numbers were. Now I can very authoritatively speak about India's migrant worker data, how many of them are in this industry or that industry. So this is how we showed it in one of our stories. We used a map to show one of the longest journeys undertaken by a migrant worker, a reverse migration. This is from Western India. That's from Surat, Gujarat to Ganjam in Orissa. It was a 1700 kilometer journey. When I interviewed him, he was at a quarantine center in his village and was being monitored by a rural healthcare woman worker with whom we reported on in a later story, which I mentioned. So the key learnings from this entire reportage of last year was data, like the importance of data. And when you're not getting it readily, like let's say if you don't have it readily from the ILO or from the UN, whatever, like your you know, go-to sources. If you don't have local data from there, then tap all the other sources, which are nonprofits, which are local bodies. Somebody has some data somewhere. And then you go to an academic and they do the work for you. They'll contextualize it. They'll pull out the figure for you. And they'll say, this is, the figure that you can rely on. And in this case, while all of us as journalists have kind of uh, internalized this lesson in our reporting on humanitarian issues, that it's the interviewees, interviewees uh, uh, convenience that's more important than yours. Like it's not because it's working hours for you so you can speak to them and maybe not later, but in the, all along and more so in during the reporting of these pandemic related worker issues, it was always important to give priority to their time, to their convenience, to understand that they were running out of cash, they were running out of mobile phone recharge, they, were, they had no battery. So to expect them to give you an interview was, uh, was an impossible task on many occasions. So the story at that time was not more important than the person's uh, convenience. So we had to revisit the same people several times because we had the number and we had to revisit them to first to check if they were safe and then to say, can you please speak to us for a few minutes if that works for you. Explaining the reason to do the story if they have the patience to understand for in a minute, like how quickly it's an elevator pitch of sorts that how quickly can I explain the reason why I'm doing the story without taking too much of your time to give you the big picture perspective on why it's important for you to talk to me. Then consulting editors, like I said, in this case, my editor, trafficking and slavery editor in London at that time, Kieran Gilbert, and the editor-in-chief, Belinda Goldsmith, had nudged us early on to focus on marginalized communities and look up these stories. So that helped, and we were consulting with them throughout through the process. And of course, uh, while we covered the obvious stories of uh, tracking the exodus and the issues that were emerging uh, with every single uh, passing day, 
uh, we continue to delve deeper into the big picture stories that were emerging uh, that were pandemic related and forced labor related. Some of the examples that I showed, like child marriage and uh, the garment workers. Also, uh, one thing I don't know if I mentioned, yeah, journalist, not activist, which is something the ethical dilemma when you're contacting them. So many of them had no food. They were seeking transport help. They were seeking shelter. And uh, if I, as a journalist, wire them money, how much ever compelling uh, the case is, and I feel compelled to do so, I, the biggest learning is to not do that and instead make the connections with a nonprofit, with local officials, because if they should not feel that a journalistic interview ends with a payment. And that's not the message that you would want uh, to go out. So what we did was connected a lot of these uh, people who were fleeing cities to nonprofits and to local officials. So they got some help. And that's about it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Roly. Uh, and um, I, your, your, your notion that you um, stay in touch with your editors is perfect for us to now go to Annie Kelly with The Guardian. Yeah. Hello, uh, just Sam, um, just really, really happy to be here. And it was just so impressive listening to both of those presentations to like amazing, amazing projects and amazing examples of really brilliant, impactful, and also very human uh, approaches to looking at forced labor and human trafficking. Um, I thought I'd do something slightly different. I thought that today what I would do is um, come in with my editor's hat on and maybe give a perspective of what it's like to be commissioning and editing um, human trafficking and forced labor investigations, and also just give an overview of the kind of um, investigations and stories that I've been commissioning um, through The Guardian over the last uh, nine or 10 years. Um, I kind of act, um, I have another role, I do reporting myself as well. So um, I've actually reported on some of the stories that I was gonna talk about today, but I'm kind of here really um, to provide a bit of a kind of editor's lens to this subject so just really really briefly and also um i'm getting some help with my slides because i'm a complete disaster with tech at the moment so um i'll be doing a very cheesy next slide please um approach to this so first just really quickly um I am the editor of The Guardian's uh, Rights and Freedom reporting project. Uh, before that, I ran a special reporting project on uh, human trafficking and uh, forced labour and other forms of modern slavery for The Guardian. Um, I started this work with The Guardian after years of being a foreign correspondent for them in 2012. Um, and it was it's part of an ongoing um, philanthropic partnership with a foundation called Humanity United, which is part of the Guardian's Foundation's Journalism Initiative, where we look at specialist reporting projects supported by philanthropic partners. Um, so in 2012, we started this uh, focus looking at human trafficking and modern slavery. Um, the first year we were really floundering around trying to work out what to do and then in 2013 we decided that we were going to focus almost specific, uh, almost exclusively on investigations looking at forced labour and human trafficking uh, with a special focus on supply chains, migration and the kind of systemic drivers of exploitation. Um, in the end between 2012 and 2019 we did I think nearly 600 pieces of content on um, modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, and we were the first newspaper to have a dedicated reporting project, on Modern Slavery. So um, uh, we then expanded into more general human rights reporting in 2020, which is where the Rights and Freedom Project comes in. So for, the, for this year, um, for the last year, we've been looking more generally at human rights reporting, but supply chains and um, forced labor and human trafficking is still a really big part of what we do. And it's definitely the area of work that we have had the biggest impact in these kind of um, investigations. So um, just the next slide is, um, kind of asking uh, so I thought as an editor I often ask myself when I'm considering doing commission you know is what makes a good forced labor or human trafficking investigation is this story going to kind of hit some of these buttons for the Guardian um, I think uh, I think it's been very useful seeing those two presentations because they're really good examples of what make fantastic forced labor and human trafficking investigations really solid reporting 
uh, really forensic supply chain work, but with this extremely human lens, like really telling very, very human stories about how it actually impacts people at the bottom of, of these big supply chains or in situations uh, like COVID, which forced people into positions they never thought they would be in. Um, when it comes to supply chain work, uh, I think uh, one of the most important things is trying to find either a clear link or a clear narrative that strikes a chord with the reader. So if you are sitting over breakfast in London or LA or um, Auckland and you're picking up the newspaper, why, you know, it's got to be something um, that, that you can relate to. So you've got to try and find a way to really engage readers, either with a really, really compelling storytelling or with a link to something that they might be using in their everyday lives. So um, this could be a sporting event that they uh, that somebody is feels very passionately about the cup of coffee they're drinking the clothes that they're wearing but if you can make a very uh, visible um, and, and and kind of very emotional link between the lives of someone thousands of miles away and why the person using that product that they have their fingerprints on you know why they should care that's really really important um, at the heart of it all is good storytelling so you you can do a very forensic supply chain investigation but if you if you don't relate uh, very if you don't relate to the reader why they should care and how it really impacts people at the other end um, it can come off as a very cold forensic take, which which doesn't um, cannot have the impact that you want it to have. Um, obviously, forensic and really uh, thorough investigative journalism at the, is at the heart of all of this. And if you think about something that either uncovers uncovers the truth about a commodity or a supply chain that that we all uh, that exists that we all kind of don't know what is at the bottom of it or reveal some kind of unknown truth around the lives of people that could be working in plain sight. So we did lots of reporting and commissioning around modern slavery in the UK, in car washes, in nail bars, in restaurants. So it's this idea of um, exposing the, the truth of the worst forms of labor exploitation kind of happening in plain sight all around us. Um, impact also, uh, I think it's very important to consider how will this investigation hold power to account and how could it have some kind of positive impact or change. And to do that, it's often very good to have that in mind before you start an investigation so that you can always make sure that 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 you've got that in mind. You know, what is it that needs to change? What are some of the solutions and how can this reporting try and drive that change? And most important to me, I think that these investigations are so important about giving voice to people who are hidden or ignored so can you platform the lives or the voices of those people who uh, are often deliberately obscured by the by our globalized supply chains and um, and by our governments um kind of the next slide um so how do you find these stories um I think that's a question that I get asked a lot by journalists who are starting off trying to do these kind of investigations um I think thinking about the things that we use, that we wear, that we that are in our everyday lives and thinking about how to follow that train trail down to the bottom of those commodity supply chains, uh, how are they made, who makes them, where are they made, uh, what are the companies that are profiting along the way. Um, and if you follow that train that trail down, they often um, provide a real genesis of good impactful supply chain investigations. Um, I think talking to those people on the front line, um, many of our stories, of our best stories come through uh, really good relationships that we develop with labour and trade unions, uh, people who are indirectly in contact with the workers, any membership organisations or advocacy groups and local advocacy groups are really helpful. Local NGOs and journalists and activists can also be extremely important to partner with. Um, anyone who's able to give you a sense of what is happening on the ground and also be able to advise you about the best way of approaching people to get a sense of whether it is safe and whether people want to be uh, want to tell their stories and are able or willing to talk about their working lives in a way that's protecting them, but also potentially leading you to a story. Um, social media obviously can be very, very useful. 
see who is advocating and agitating. Uh, we recently used um, Facebook groups. We found lots of Facebook groups um, uh, in Peru who were advocating. Uh, they were family groups set up around missing women. And they were, uh, these were these families who were just posting pictures of missing women uh, every day. And we were able to kind of make contact with them through through this Facebook group and try and see whether we could work with them on trying to uncover what might be happening to their family members. And um, reports and surveys are really, really useful as well. So for instance, the US State Department does an annual uh, report into um, child labor and goods made with forced labor. And I mean, literally spending hours scouring through that and trying to see if any of any of those, any of anything that's in those reports could lead to a potential investigation is a really, really good way of starting. So I wanted just to whip through some of the different types of investigations that I've commissioned over the years at The Guardian. Um, one of our most impactful investigations has been uh, looking at the uh, forced labour on the construction sites uh, in Qatar. So looking at the situation facing Nepali workers um, on uh, building Qatar's uh, World Cup stadiums and infrastructure. Um, I think this, this investigation uh, took about nine months to, um, to get over the line. What we wanted to do was try and reveal the systemic um, and accepted forced labor of Nepali migrant workers uh, that was happening um, with almost complete impunity and was relying on corrupt and unethical recruitment practices and all of it was masked in uh, huge racial discrimination and denial that uh, that labor abuses were happening by the Qatari state. Um, we were prompted into looking into this after the controversy over Qatar's World Cup bid. And um, when we, uh, we started the story in Nepal, where we had a reporter, Pete Patterson, go to the airport in Kathmandu, and he literally spent six weeks counting coffins coming back from the Gulf and just trying to understand uh, the potential loss of life that was happening due to dangerous and exploitative working conditions in Qatar. This then led us to spend months in Qatar trying to talk to migrant workers and trying to establish that the, 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 that the working conditions that they were facing amounted to forced labour under ILO guidelines. Um, and it hinged on really proving that uh, this was something that was happening at scale in Qatar. Um, I think the massive challenge for us was making sure that we protected the workers, that this was not something that would lead to job loss or uh, the debt bondage that all of these workers were in, that, that it wouldn't mean that this would make their situation worse. But in terms of impact, this, this investigation has probably had the longest tail of any work that we've done. We're still publishing stories. Um, you know, almost 10 years on, we're doing another big investigation in a couple of weeks. And this investigation really has led to very, very systemic change happening in Qatar. It's, uh, I think it's contributed massively to the end of the kafala system. Not enough has been done, but I don't think Qatar can now ever, um, ever deny that it has an issue with migrant worker rights. When we first went to them, they had no concept of even what that meant. Um, the next slide is a more of a kind of traditional supply chain investigation. We looked at uh, Lululemon and conditions for uh, very young women making Lululemon leggings in a factory in Bangladesh. Um, I think this is a really, really good example of just doing very targeted work, looking at looking behind the kind of CSR claims of uh, of big organizations who are making very high volume, low cost production models in countries like Bangladesh, garment workers. Um, I've, you know, I feel very, very strongly that the fashion industry still is not held enough to account about the working conditions and how their production models uh, contribute to enormous worker exploitation across the world. This was, um, this investigation was sparked by a press release that we got from a UN foundation and Lululemon, which was uh, announcing the start of a big worker wellbeing program whereby Lululemon would be giving um, yoga classes to uh, garment workers in some of their factories in Bangladesh. 
and were making a big fuss about how much their company was empowering young women to be themselves and to be healthy and fit. So we then decided that we would look into the reality of, of life for women who are actually making these 88 pound Lululemon leggings. We were able to access their supplier list and we then just did a, we just then uh, made contact with unions who we knew were working in Bangladesh and were able to identify the factories and then approach workers through the, through the unions to see whether they would like to talk to us about the conditions that they were facing in that factory. Um, it was, uh, it, it still took three or four months, but it was done in a way that I felt kind of was quite targeted. And it's just a really good example of how um, a supply chain investigation can um, kind of expose the reality behind, um, kind of, you know, uh, com company CSR policies. Um, the next slide um, is an investigation that we did into women who were working in farming in Sicily. Uh, the reason that I wanted to show this investigation was that this was actually a supply chain that we couldn't stand up. It was impossible for us to be able to go and connect the dots between the vegetables that the women, the Romanian women in Italy were picking and back to big uh, companies um, in the UK. We just we just couldn't get the evidence that we needed to do that. But I felt that it was a very important story because we were able, I think, to, uh, to expose um, something that was happening at scale in Sicily, which was being ignored by the authorities. And we wanted to do a story that was really um, giving voice to some of the women who were suffering horrendous exploitation and abuse uh, trapped in farms, um, in across Sicily who were there because they were unable to provide um, for their families back home and they were enduring horrible conditions in um, in, in uh, Sicily because they felt that they couldn't go back uh, because they had to provide for their for their children back home in Romania. Um, there were a couple of women who who wanted to go public with their um, with their experiences in Sicily. It was a very um, difficult call for us to to know whether this was going to have some kind of you know negative impact. Uh, so that was it was a good example of where you have to we had to negotiate very um, difficult ethical questions about um, about their uh, about whether they should be going on the record or not and whether we should be using photos. Um, but um, it was a story where we spent kind of 2000 words explaining the trap that these women fell into when they came across to Italy and found themselves facing conditions that they never expected to face. And it was, you know, just by the, because they were women, because they were poor, because no one was investigating what was happening on these farms, they were enduring these terrible conditions. So it was a story where we did an investigation into forced labor, which was linked to a supply chain, but we made these women's stories the heart, the heart of the story. It actually had enormous impact, this story. Um, the police set up a specific unit to investigate the exploitation of Romanian women and actually uncovered a huge EU trafficking ring between Romania and Italy. But I think kind of having, having that impact and having those really, those stories like at the heart of the story was something that really, um, you know, made this story stand out and made it impossible for the Italian government not to take action. Um, the next story is around, <laughs> was a story that we looked at uh, through the PPE crisis last year, um, where we wanted to look at where PPE was coming from. And this is an example of a story where we couldn't get in to talk to workers. We couldn't access these factories uh, in China where we believed that there were North Korean workers making PPE that was being sent around the world, including uh, the UK. This investigation instead relied on being able to piece together lots of different source materials. So we used um, social media posts uh, where the factory was um, trying to uh, get business across China and uh, for different um, procurement companies across the world where they were uh, using videos and photos from inside their factories. We were then cross-referencing those photos with North Korean slogans that we saw written on the walls of these factories and um, looking at whether that we were then having to look at whether these companies were recruiting workers in North Korea. So, um, and then using Google images to try and um, match the inside of the factories and the photos to the architecture of the factories on Google maps. So it was an incredibly painstaking 
process that rely that where we didn't have any first hand accounts from the workers themselves. Um, it was a very, very tricky investigation to put together, but um, I think it's a good example of how it is possible to do that if you are able to kind of take a piecemeal approach to using any available information on open source, uh, social media, any kind of open source evidence to be able to paint a compelling picture and be able to use a public interest argument to get this stuff to publication. I'm just really aware that I'm probably running out of time. Um, but I just I know to it's totally fascinating, Annie, and um, I love what you're doing here, which is showing that it, it's not a particular industry. It's so sweeping. Why don't you why don't you walk us through one more and then we'll and then we'll pivot to Charles. Yeah, maybe I'll just okay. skip over then. And I just I just think it's really important just to go through these last two slides. And sorry if I've been um, speaking over my lot of time. I wanted just very, very quickly to run through um, what is the role of an editor in a forced labor investigation. I think it's very important that um, that the role of an editor is very, very clear for anyone who is wanting to either pitch or work with an editor closely on these kind of forced labor investigations. What I see my role being is to help commission and obviously approve the budget and steer the editorial direction of any initial reporting, provide support and guidance throughout the investigation, and also deal with any production scheduling. I think the most crucial way that editors can help is by doing the heavy lift internally. So that's liaising with the lawyers, helping with any right of replies and crucially championing the reporting within the organization. And when it comes to what I'm looking for in a supply chain investigation, when someone comes to me saying they would like to do a story, I'm looking for a clear objective and an outcome. So what is it that you want to investigate and what do you expect or hope to find? And how are you gonna back that up with a really clear and thorough reporting plan, which where the risk assessment, so that's a risk assessment both to the reporting team, but to anyone that you're speaking to is at the heart of that reporting plan. So how is this gonna put anybody that you are speaking to potentially at risk? Um, a trauma-informed reporting plan and an understanding of a duty of care to contributors is crucial. And I would stress clear communications and honesty is the thing that I look for most. If there is a problem, if, you're, if you uh, are unsure about something, if, you've, if you feel like your investigation is foundering, or crucially, if you make a mistake, it is so important that you communicate that to your editors so that they can help sort that out and help try and bring that investigation to you know over the line i've had terrible situations where people have felt too ashamed or too nervous to come and tell me that they've made a mistake or they've got a problem and it's created huge post-publication issues so i would say that that's the most important thing like clear communication and honesty and just you know really sticking to the story and and being tenacious wish, <laughs> wish we could bring all our editors to your house <laughs> <laughs> for a little lecture. Um, thank you for all of that. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to pivot now to Charles, who's going to talk to us about a tool he's created that can help all of us conduct these investigations. Thank you, Martha. Um, hi to everyone. And um, I was really fascinated by the earlier um, presentations, um, which I think um, kind of resonate with some of the content that's um, that's within this this tool uh, that I'll be showing quite quickly. Um, I should, let me just mention that usually what happens with these panels is you have a lot of people join and then slowly slip away and nobody's slipping away. Everybody is aptly just completely focused and sticking sticking with this um, because all of you guys are just this work is so important and so interesting. So thank you. So I have no pressure if they all leave now. It's it's uh, it's just uh, because we ran out of time. Um, no, basically, um, the International Labour Organization. I I've been working with um, the ILO for several years now, um, mostly working with journalists in trying to help them understand some of the issues that the ILO is working on within the world of work. And one of the important issues what the ILO considers a fundamental principle in right of work is uh, forced labor. 
Um, there are two ILO conventions with regards to forced labor, which kind of set out the definitions. And so in 2017, uh, the ILO reached out to me and to another journalist, Kevin Burden, to try and draft a resource for journalists that would be a, some sort of a one size fits all tool. Um, it had to be global. Uh, it had to serve the purpose of helping, let's say a student understand this issue, but also maybe a, a, a trainer use this resource in a training situation. So it was very difficult to, to design. And especially like uh, the, the stories that were shared by the previous speakers, forced labor can be found in so many different places. It's all over the world. And it's in so many different industries that it's quite difficult in one tool to be able to talk about also the specificity of all of those industries, because the garment sector is quite different from agriculture or from, I don't know what happens in the um, criminal justice system in the United States. So all of this is very different, but you can find forced labor in all these issues. So the, the way we came about was to try and have a very pragmatic approach. We said, what, what would we need for someone to be ready to pitch a story to any, for example, <laughs> we would need that person to understand what we are talking about. And, and just like you said at the beginning, Martha, uh, there are some conceptual, I would say, terminology issues around forced labor uh, that need to be understood. Otherwise, that can create confusion. Um, if we are not speaking about the same thing, uh, and if a journalist is not able to clearly understand what he's speaking about, that, that just generates confusion. Um, so the first module of the toolkit is about understanding the story. What is forced labor? And in the course of developing the, 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 the toolkit, and it's been said, I think, by various speakers today, we found out that the recruitment process was really a strategic moment. Actually, a lot of people find themselves forced to work um, because they've been recruited in unfair and unethical circumstances. And this linkage between, you know, unfair recruitment practices, debt bondage at the recruitment stage, and forced labor down the road is actually quite important. So this is why we, we created linkages between forced labor and this initiative with the, which the ILO has been championing with a number of organizations for the past 10 years about, which is the fair recruitment framework, fair recruitment initiative of trying to make sure that recruitment is fair. And one very simple principle would be that workers don't pay recruitment costs or associated costs, which unfortunately uh, tends to be the norm in many uh, uh, labor migration corridors, especially. And, and obviously it's important to say a word about the legal framework. Now, all of what I'm referring to is actually specific sections of the toolkit, which are very interactive. Um, that it's quite short in terms of text uh, because we don't know how much time people have to spend on such a resource, um, but it's very heavy in links. Uh, so there's about 150 links within the toolkit, which means that we won't tell you a lot about what is in the ILO uh, global estimates of 2017, which is basically the one that has been used for the past five years to tell us that there's 24.9 million people in forced labor and roughly around 40 million people in modern slavery. But we do put the link. And so if you're interested in that type of information, you can go here. Um, it's also full of um, testimonies from journalists. Uh, what I, what my job was, was to actually look out for journalists who've been reporting these issues around the world and reach out to them uh, to basically record videos and testimonies from them uh, to have their insights on specific aspects and issues. Uh, supposedly someone who's been through this first module of understanding the story is kind of ready to go and start looking for a story. Uh, and we assume that before you actually go on the ground and do the kind of work that's been presented today, you would try and find the appropriate story and ideally pitch it and convince an editor within your organization or if you're a freelance with, with other organizations. And here again, what we've been trying to do is to do something quite simple 
and create families of story ideas. Now, the human aspect of the story has been stressed quite importantly by other speakers. I think it's very important. And there is a number of questions you can ask yourself, which can uh, help you find ideas of stories. Uh, you know, we're talking about the recruitment process, how are workers recruited, what are their working conditions, what's the journey, uh, are they smuggled into a country, what happens, what's the reaction of their community when they're freed from situations of forced labor, all of those questions, and we try to connect that with what we think uh, are interesting examples of reporting. Uh, so here again, lots of um, links also considering the fact that um, most probably if you want to find an interesting story on forced labor you need to uh, be aware of uh, the many different stories that exist and it's we can give a lot of guidance suggestions but the best way to go about it is actually to document yourself and to read existing stories um, uh, but it's not just about the people, it's about work conditions, we talk about money, we talk about justice, we talk about discrimination, everything that actually feeds into uh, forced labor. Um, afterwards, once you have a story, you need to go to the ground and you actually need to collect the story. That's the important part of uh, uh, getting uh, into the difficult locations and a lot of what is in the toolkit has been stressed by the different speakers. I won't uh, say it again, but the many ethical challenges that this type of reporting raises, the difficulty of working with vulnerable sources of information, the safety and security concerns for journalists, but also for the sources of information, the mental health issues that are associated with this type of reporting, both for the sources of information, but also for journalists. I don't think we stress that very much, but this is a very, very difficult type of journalism. Um, and um, it's interesting uh, in the toolkit, we've put resources about you know how uh, journalists can also speak with their editors about some of the mental health issues that can be related to this type of reporting. Uh, I think that's quite important. And then we dedicate a full section to actually how to tell these stories, how to consider cross-border cooperation. Um, and here again, it's a way for us to showcase a number of very good examples from around the world of uh, very good reporting um, um, uh, by journalists. The last module is a shorter type of module and it's more about, you know, once you've done the reporting, it doesn't necessarily end there. Uh, because especially if you're, I mean, if we look at, at uh, uh, Robin McDowell's piece about palm oil, I don't think you would consider that the story ends when you publish it. You're actually expecting some sort of reaction or change. And so it, it's typically a type of story when there is possibly a life after the story. The, the stories about companies in Qatar and the kafala system and the fact that the Guardian would keep an interest in these stories for so much time shows that it's not a, a, a topic or an issue or a situation that you can necessarily solve with just one, one story. Um, so that's, that's a little bit, a very quick demo of what you can find. So go and explore the toolkit. There's a homepage now on the ILO website because initially we designed it in English, but then we adapted it in a number of languages. I saw in the chat, someone asking why this session was not available in Arabic. The toolkit is available in Arabic. We've adapted it. And when I say adapted, it's not, we didn't just translate it. We kind of contextualize it to the Arabic context to make sure that the links that are included and the examples of good stories uh, are relevant to an Arabic speaking audience and ideally come from the Arabic speaking media. Um, what we've also done uh, is uh, we've um, done smaller versions uh, of the toolkit adapted to the national context. Uh, so uh, one example is this is the, so now it's a PDF file, it's not a website, but this is the Uzbek version of the toolkit uh, of the uh, shorter Uzbek toolkit on forced labor and fair recruitment. Um, We've also designed it in English, by the way, because we think journalists in Uzbekistan are interested, obviously, but some journalists outside of Uzbekistan can be interested as well. And it's basically the same structure. It's just that some sections have more specific information about a country. 
all of the examples come from Uzbekistan, and especially the section about the, 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 the legal framework is Uzbek specific, because if you're going to be reporting on forced labor in Uzbekistan, you want to know specifically what the legal framework in Uzbekistan says, and whether Uzbekistan has ratified ILO conventions on forced labor or related international instruments with forced labor. Um, and we use these tools to do a series of workshops. I was doing a workshop with Uzbek journalists just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and so behind the toolkit, there is a very important effort by the ILO and a number of partners to actually um, capacitate and help journalists um, do the type of reporting that we've seen uh, on, on demonstration today and have, see that from around the world and especially in countries where forced labor is happening, I would say in more important proportions, because I've said earlier, it's happening everywhere, uh, but there are regions in the world where forced labor is more prevalent and it's not necessarily where most of the reporting is being done. Uh, lastly, I just wanna say a word about uh, journalism education. Um, I think for a number of reasons, uh, this topic is, just a fantastic topic to introduce in journalism education. Not because we wanna um, have hundreds of specialized reporter reporting on these issues, that's not possible in the near future for a number of reasons, uh, but because it's a very interesting case study uh, to discuss all of what journalism is about. Um, and, and some of the very concrete challenges that journalists can find reporting on forced labor, but reporting on a number of other issues. Um, and here, and I'll be sharing the links in the chat, um, this is a syllabus that we designed with the Asian Institute of Journalism and Communication. And we currently have about 12 journalism schools in the Philippines who are introducing forced labor within an elective course on reporting labor migration. Um, that's very important in my opinion, because um, uh, the Philippines is a country with about 10% of its population that goes uh, looking for working opportunities abroad. Uh, it's so important for the economy, for the society, for a number of reasons. The Philippines need to have journalists that are familiar with these issues and that are able to report on these issues from the Philippines. Um, and so knowing that future journalists will have been trained on these issues is quite positive to maybe seeing forced labor diminish in, in the near future. Thanks, Charles. Um, well, we have um, run out of time and I'm afraid our Zoom is gonna kick us all off quite soon. So I wanna make sure to um, suggest that if you have questions, maybe Rolly, Annie, Robin, Charles can answer them in the chat at the Pathable site as we go forward, um, you know, just for today, but also, I think a lot of people know that they are either a sending country or a receiving country. And what we typically do at these conferences is have a, a round robin as some of you who are online today have participated in before where you um, can meet a journalist. Let's say you are in Nepal and you wanna meet someone in Qatar who's also a journalist to team up on a project. Um, GIJN can make those connections for you. They're, regional editors can introduce you to reporters in other places so that you can make those connections and have those partnerships and do that reporting. Um, Charles was mentioning that these stories are so important. Guys, so much of what we report on is so depressing and so hard to have an impact, but we collectively are tipping the needle on these issues. Um, London and UK are beginning to halt imports of forced labor goods. The United States has had now really increased their seizures. Um, the voices of these people who you are able to elevate, Roly and Annie and Robin, they're being heard and it does make a difference. And people's lives can be improved through this journalism, which is so rare in our field. So often we report on, you know, they're already they're already destroyed, but we can make a difference with this. Um, I'm gonna just ask a quick question here, which is um, uh, because Manish has asked several times for Robin. Um, sometimes the human traffickers are cross-border. Um, they link to cross-border 
issues. There are groups of people who operate from both sides, like a well-organized syndicate. What is, do you have any tips, Robin, or any of you others, to investigate these cross-border syndicates who are leading to human trafficking um, for this forced labor? I mean, I guess it's the same as, as, as all kind of reporting on the ground reporting. It's talking to the workers and kind of doing the dot to dot from their journey. Like, do they have names? Do, there, do people have similar stories? Are the smuggling routes the same? Are we seeing smuggling routes change? Um, are labor rights groups, ILO, others, I, uh, you know, um, uh, IMO, IOM, um, noticing changing routes? Um, you can figure this out. And I think, I think that is a really important part of the story, although it does shift a lot. And quickly. Um, I want to note that Journalism Fund EU is letting us know from Paolo that they offer grants for journalists in Asia and Europe to investigate these stories. Uh, Annie had talked about the budgeting issues, and they there are many. Um, everybody, thanks so much for joining us this morning, this evening, this midday, this middle of the night. It's um, really sad to not be together with all of you. After these sessions is when the real work begins because so many stories have been produced on human trafficking and labor abuse out of these conferences. And so I encourage us all to try to network as best we can. And I'll see you all in person at the next GIJN conference. Thank you all. <laughs>